morning, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. Um, and I'm talking about contractual disappointment today. Um, and the disappointment begins uh, with you coming here hoping to find out all about the contracts feature in C++, which unfortunately, disappointingly, um, didn't make it into C++ 20 and then um, didn't make it into C++ 23 either. Um, and uh, hopefully it'll be um, a, a, a better feature for it. And I certainly will be talking about a lot of things that um, affect my, um, uh, my thoughts about the feature. But trying to show you any syntax, I think, would be a bit premature at this point. Uh, that's still under discussion. Um, but it's, um, it's quite a broad topic. Um, hopefully you'll get plenty out of it. Um, and uh, I'll just talk about me briefly. Um, I live in um, uh, County Clare in Ireland. I work in automotive. Um, previously, I worked in um, games. I've done, done, done work on um, some back-end servers as well. Um, and just um, for fun, I mean, I do things other than, you know, geek out. But uh, um, coding-wise, I, I, I work on a numerics library. I'm really interested in so workflow. This is sort of my passion, is um, how to make life easier for developers. I tend to be on a team where um, there are plenty of graduates and undergraduates and, and mid-level developers who need to work effectively in C++. And that's a real, a real challenge, a really interesting challenge, and one that I'm sort of very um, sort of passionate about and, and have, have good feelings about. And this is all about, a lot of this is about how to do that effectively. I also play with word games. Um, I may show off one or two of those later on. You can probably guess, guess which one I'll be concentrating on. Um, and I'm sort of quite interested in um, the, the evolution of the progression of C++. And uh, so I tend to kind of uh, um, uh, lurk in, in various study groups as well, including the contracts study group. Um, and there are some links. I posted them in the, in the, in the chat and on, on Twitter there. Um, if you're interested, if you want to follow along with the slides, there's various links, obligatory Compiler Explorer links and various other things as we go along. Okay. So I'll start with some definitions first. Um, uh, what do I mean by um, contracts? Well, um, uh, contracts are a very general thing. They're not just a particular um, language feature. And there are lots of great definitions out there. Um, this one's as good as any from Alistair Meredith's CppCon talk, which is a great talk if you want a, a really sort of in-depth um, view of contracts, a much, a much broader one. Um, and he, he chose um, a, a, an exchange of promises between a client and a provider. And um, I, will take, I will take that phrase and sort of reword it um, in, in, for various different types of contracts as we go along. Disappointment, um, this is something that, uh, that was used in the title of, um, of a paper from uh, about seven years ago by Lawrence Krauf on the, um, the uh, originally sort of published for the study group 14 to try and deal with how, um, yeah, how we deal with things going wrong at runtime. Um, and then uh, I'd sort of maybe qualify that slightly by sort of including bugs, mostly because there's often um, uncertainty, ambiguity about the difference between bugs and errors. So Lawrence is really talking about errors. Um, and then in this later paper, there's um, some really great clarification about the difference between bugs uh, and errors. And um, a lot of what inspired this talk is, is colleagues and um, collaborators on the internet sort of asking me, you know, which is which? How do you deal with this or that problem? Um, and often, you know, it's not immediately clear uh, what kind of runtime disappointment we're talking about. And you, you, I'd, I'd say that bugs are a kind of runtime disappointment, um, which is kind of the main sort of message I want to get across through the lens of contracts. So let's um, take a look at various contracts that I identify as important when I'm, when I'm coding. So four different types of contract that we're going to look at today. The C++ API contract is the one that people are probably thinking about when they're, they're interested in the, the, the language feature. And then the C++ standards a, a, a contract as well. The end user contract is the one that sort of um, we as developers are most kind of um, uh, most responsible for. And then there's this 
um, special test user contract here. It's a um, it's something quite different um, to the other contracts. I'm, I'm not sure how well understood or defined it is, so I want to try and talk about that today as well. Um, so all contracts have various attributes. I'm going to single, I'm going to hone in on a few. Um, the agreement, um, who is the client and the provider of the contract, and what happens when things go wrong. And I'll concentrate mostly on um, uh, what happens when the client um, breaks the contract, because that's, I think, just the richest vein to talk about, really. Um, so those four types of um, contract um, uh, split out by the different attributes gives us a nice matrix here um, um, with just basically a bunch of uh, doc documents as the agreement. And, and here I, I should, should add, a, you know, well-documented well code is, uh, um, uh, so well-written code is, is its own document, ideally. Um, but there obviously is, is this one there. It's quite a, quite a hefty a specific <laughs> document. Um, uh, by the way, um, questions as we go, um, uh, please do interrupt me if, if there's anything you'd like to know. Um, and there are, there are. Uh, I, I like the idea of um, bribing people for uh, asking good questions or terrible ones. I don't mind. Um, so, okay, so I think what's what what really interests people the most is what happens when things go wrong when 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 contracts are broken. Um, but, um, and, and like I say, test, the test user contract is sort of the, it's the star of the show today, I would say. Um, but I, I think it's important to start with the user yeah, there. That's the, the, the user, that, that one cell in this, in this table is what, um, is what we're all kind of here to, this is what, what everything's about, really. We're sort of trying to, you know, um, uh, serve some kind of end user, and obviously, uh, um, who, who that is can vary. Um, often, you write code for yourself, um, so often you find yourself being the the, the author and the, the user and provider of a contract. Um, but ultimately, you have to make the user happy and try and be uh, user oriented. So let's start by looking at the end user contract. Um, okay, and and so that that uh, um, uh, description from Alastair, um, we take the Basically, take some of the the, um, the the cells from that matrix and kind of mad lib them into this um, uh, definition of the end user contract, um, where we're basically um, providers of of the contract, and the user is the is is, is the sort of um, um, the client of the contract. Um, and um, the important thing about this contract, and uh, one of the things that kind of sort of differentiates bugs from errors, is that um, uh, contract violation can happen, and it's kind of okay in a program for the the, the, the contract to be violated um, because people make mistakes. Sometimes the only way you can find out how to use a program correctly is by trying things out and getting it wrong and kind of breaking the rules of, of how to run that program. Um, but also, uh, um, you know, you have to often account for the fact that people might be deliberately trying to misuse the software um, in a way that's that's trying to compromise a system or do something else mischievous. Um, we still kind of talk about it as if it's errors, but we just have to be very um, careful about them um, and handle them. Um, so errors are they're sort of they're in, they're things going wrong, disappointment, but they're sort of modelled within the system um, and. They, the real world kind of calls, causes these things. Um, uh, input to the program is typically where you should be wary of errors. Um, so that you know the command line, um, network and file I/O things plugged into the, the system where the program is running, um, and just sort of the real world generally uh, is a messy place where where uh, unexpected things kind of arise. And the file system and string, for example. The UI elements, um, if, if you don't consider them as UI elements, ask yourself whether once Skynet takes over, um, will it be that concerned with file systems or strings? It probably won't bother with them so much. It'll probably just use databases and uh, vectors, don't you think? Yeah, you thought about this, surely? Um, and then Chrono is a classic example. We had a, a great talk yesterday uh, talking about time a lot. Um, 
but sort of generally, um, this is this is kind of how I, I think of this: that uh, um, errors are typically caused by how chaotic and complex and unpredictable the real world is. Um, yeah, your program could be perfect. Errors are still going to arise. So they sort of tend to, I sort of, they seem to fall into two categories as far as I can see. Just things um, that are not just state that isn't quite right that is, is necessary. Um, but then also f more fiddly stuff to do with, um, uh, you know, file formats and syntax errors and, and uh, things that people can get wrong in, in the small, so to speak. And, um, yeah, we need to handle these violations. And uh, so there's so kind of two sides to this. We sort of need to um, acknowledge and, and maybe change control flow, do something um, do something different when, when an, an error is, is um, detected. But also, really crucially, we have to um, let, let our user know that something is wrong. Um, and really, that involves just sort of being empathetic and, and considerate and probably um, using a lot of bad programs over the years um, and being annoyed by that and wanting to do better and, and not be that, that developer who made that, that unhelpful program that just sort of says file not found or syntax error after uh, you've, you've passed a, a megabyte of data into it. Okay, so how do you deal with um, uh, errors? I mean, it, it depends. Sorry, I don't have a day to go through all the different ways you can, um, you, you might have to deal with this problem. It's, it, it's, it's difficult and it depends on a lot of things. So um, batch or steady state, these, basically these, these are the sort of, I'm listing some of the things I think are uh, interesting facets of different types of programs. And by batch or steady state, um, a program that you, that you run and it uh, takes some input, um, nice if it's just a console program. Um, you run it and it does some stuff. It does all the work it needs to do, and it and it finishes, uh, produces a result. Um, that's very nice, very simple. And then steady state's kind of everything else. You know, apps, microcontrollers, simulations, operating systems, um, browsers, um, servers. Um, yeah, stuff where the thing probably has to keep going after an error has occurred. Um, do you have real time constraints? That's uh, um, if you don't, you're, that's that's very fortunate because it, it avoids a whole lot of problems. But uh, you might be um, particularly working on a microcontroller or a, um, VR software where you absolutely cannot s pause and and and, uh, and to to deal with stuff. You have to just keep keep going. Um, and then, you know, what what's the what's the form of communication between the user and and, and the program? Is it just a console program? Is there a GUI? Or, or is it a RESTful API, you know, a, ser a server responding? Or is it um, something else? There could be all sorts of other, other ways that the program could communicate with the user. Or terrifyingly, there might be nothing. You might be working on a microcontroller that has, has no LEDs. Um, and how do you, how do you uh, um, get feedback from a system like that? And then, as if that wasn't enough, you might be writing a, a library, a library which might be used by other developers who are faced with the, the whole gamut of these other these other situations? Um, so th this is this is a really tough kind of tough area, and and largely because C plus plus is quite versatile. It um, it kind of um, we, we struggle with uh, with finding a, a good one good way to to deal with this. There probably isn't a, a single ideal way for everybody. So, but if you're lucky, it's a, here we have a um, kind of like a batch, a batch program, perhaps, or maybe a part of a program that's it's it's taking some input and uh, it's going to produce some output here. I've I've, I've um, come up with some definitions. Um, so to begin with, um, here I've written a, I've, here's an example of a, a really nice uh, um, first function to call in your in a program where you maybe take the the, the command line parameters pass them into a function which returns something sanitized or, or fails. Um, yeah, if, you, if, you, if you're able to write a function like this, then that's, that's really great. You can um, um, go through and uh, check for all sorts of things that could be wrong with the input that the user has provided. And what's returned, you know, is 
is in a good state where you can you can work on it without any surprises. Um, and then here's the the actual work side of things, uh, where you take that that input, um, if you are able to get it from the the command line, do some work. And in this example, it's arbitrary, but it's returning back you know maybe uh, the value 42 as a string or who knows what. Um, and then your main functions, um, um, nice and clean, and uh, um, just takes those functions. Uh, uh, one, one interesting thing to point out here is um, separating the digesting of the input from the doing the thing. We often see in a, in a poorly factored program is uh, command line parameters are sent deep into the, into the main sort of business logic of, of the program, um, possibly in hopes of making things more efficient, but very often in vain. Um, really, it's good to sort of... Uh, identify the phases, the, the, the transformations that happen to your data. One of them being, you know, is do I have messy stuff coming in from the world that needs to be um, vetted versus do I have exactly the input that I wanted to, to solve my problem? Um, here, so while I'm talking about runtime uh, disappointment today, um, always uh, if you can, you know, make things safe um, statically, um, and avoid errors that way, that's usually a, a, a great idea. And here we're using std span to, uh, um, to take two, two variables here, um, a number of arguments and, and a pointer to the arguments themselves. Um, the problem with, with, uh, with this is that you have two variables that are unbound. They, are, they, they could kind of get lost from one another, like you, you're, if anybody lost their luggage on the way, on the way to the conference today. It, it's a bit like this. You you kind of want to tie those things together so that they uh, they can't get confused. Particularly something like an int, you you could have all sorts of integers floating around in your program, and you accidentally get one of them mixed up with argc, then um, then that's not good. Um, so yeah, straight from the beginning, you're trying to find ways to avoid uh, having uh, creating bugs in the first place is is always is really important. Even though I'm going to talk a lot about sort of runtime side of things. Um, and here now, we can call that digest function. It's going to work or it doesn't. It could be garbage in, and uh, uh, there's nothing that can be done with it. Uh, hopefully, this is where the helpful errors that I mentioned will get printed out. And, um, and this is a really simple example where I've used std optional. There's, there are maybe better um, types for returning result or, or failure. Um, but this one, um, even in a compiler that only supports C++ 17, uh, 14, which is uh, what, I, what we often have to deal with in automotive. You, you'll often find an experimental version of optional, which, uh, which is, is good enough to do the job, even if it isn't semantically very rich. Um, so here now, if, if the, the input was fine, then we're kind of, it's uh, uh, we're plain sailing. It, it's, uh, it's a smooth path through the rest of the program. Um, and what is, whatever's going on in do the thing, Often now that that code can be um, uh, is usually um, pretty easy to maintain because you're not sort of trying to having to deal with things going wrong as you go along. Um, can any, can anybody think what might still happen uh, in in do the thing? Um, because one of the things in in Herb's um, paper, the um, uh, where bugs and errors are distinguished, is there's kind of a third category of thing that could go wrong, which is sort of a, uh, uh, yes? Yes, absolutely. The, 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 uh, the um, suggestion was lack of, lack of memory um, allocation failure. Um, that's, that's sort of treated as a, um, uh, I think it's an abstract machine um, failure. Uh, I can't remember exactly how Herb describes it, but uh, it's sort of a third category that was kind of not I'm not going into in great detail today. Also would include um, Stack Overflow, another good example, where, um, yes, it's sort of a runtime failure, and, and in theory, the, the user might um, get an error, go, oh, okay, I need to go to the shop, buy some more RAM, plug it in, run the program again. But in reality, um, programs rely so fundamentally on, on memory that when, when there's um, a, a memory failure, it's usually best to sort of... Um, just, just fail really, and uh, so even though um, C++ has uh, um, a, an exception um, uh, to catch when memory is exhausted, it's really not 
that useful, very difficult to, to use correctly. Uh, was there another comment? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, yeah. so the, the, the comment was that, that um, um, uh, output errors could also occur. Um, uh, that is true. Um, here we're just sort of printing to see out, so we're sort of uh, um, uh, just kind of brushing over that. Uh, and this is where maybe the output is pretty simple. And if, if, you're, if you don't have console output, I mean, you're in a pretty bad state probably in a, in a simple program like this. Um, but more generally, and that, that does lead on to a good point that uh, um, this is an incredibly simplistic and you know, hopeful uh, example of, a, of how to write a, a program. In reality, there, may, there could be s multiple steps where the data gets further refined and, and more um, problems could be found. And you might want to um, break down into more than two functions here. So maybe there might be um, a, a, a place where um, output is handled, um, but um, it, it could be really handy to, if there's just just one pro, one function that deals with that, whereas all of the other functions in the entire program don't have to worry about that. If you can do that, isolate that kind of uh, different types of disappointment that way, if it's opportune to do so, um, that can be really helpful. I think the the the, the ultimate example of um, where Disappointment can happen at many levels. Sort of the uh, the, the go-to example would probably, be, for me, be a, a compiler, a, um, a a tool that I use regularly, which is fantastically complex um, and uh, has to go through many many steps um, from from source code to to a sort of binary output, where things could go wrong at each of those steps. Totally different kinds of things. There's many sort of um, passes where the where where that data gets transferred transformed from one state to another, um, during which um, a, an error could occur. They, um, the compiler might identify something that the, uh, um, the user really needs to know about, and the compiler cannot continue. But um, certainly, you would not be able to shoehorn um, something like that into a two, sort of a two-function um, setup like this. OK. Oh. All right. So. I did mention um, word games, and uh, uh, you can probably guess what this one is from some of the names of the uh, um, identifiers here. Um, this is a, a, like a, I wouldn't say a real world example, but I have um, kind of uh, um, sort of come up with a, a sort of a toy program that I sort of, uh, I use to try and um, uh, test out some of, um, the, the ideas that I have without uh, without it you know causing too much damage. So basically, at work, I have to you know be, be quite serious about what I'm doing. If I'm if I want to experiment um, and sort of prove or disprove or, or, or experiment with with certain tools, then uh, then I really need a sort of a toy project. So um, I have um, a uh, what was originally called the Wordscape Solver. I'll, I'll maybe sort of go into it later. But this is sort of actual code from from that project where I'm doing a similar thing here. Um, um, in, although, in fact, um, this program is possibly even um, simpler. I'm, I'm taking, so command line is just really an alias for uh, um, um, a sequence of the command line inputs. And I'm passing into a run function. And, uh, and here I might return either um, uh, successful results or an integer representing like an exit code here, and then just, just return as such. So, uh, um, yeah, I will. Probably get to the, the Wordle program a bit more later. And it does seem to me that um, I don't know what proportion of um, talks now involve uh, Wordle at some point, but uh, it's just a nice little problem that everybody's aware of. Um, so let's go into a, a bit more into how to, um, uh, how to handle um, errors in, in our sort of relatively um, straightforward situation. So we want to report uh, errors. Um, and the, the simplest way is to, to print something to the, the standard error stream. Um, and, then, and then most of the, the difficult, difficulty comes from uh, choosing how to kind of um, exit this, this, uh, this situation that, that uh, we've found ourselves in. Um, so um, control flow for errors can involve um, exceptions, return values, um, just quitting the program. Um, 
so we'll take a look at those uh, a little more detail. So I've come up with a, a, uh, a function that is kind of pretty useless here, but um, it uh, takes a file name, um, and then from that it prints out the, the size of, uh, of, of the file. Now, um, the, the, the reason that's not super helpful is that uh, um, printing something to the, the standard output is not very versatile. You probably the caller probably wants to know what the what that size was, um, but unfortunately here we have um, we're returning failure uh, an, an error here as um, uh, in the form of a boolean um, if the if the file cannot be opened we're um, we're returning false here um, true for success and uh, generally sort of as a um, a default uh, sort of semantic you know if if you call a function and it sort of purports advertises that it's going to do something. And then it returns a boolean. Uh, I think it's sort of fair to guess that um, that's that's going to represent failure or sort of confirmation, like sort of uh, uh, yes, I will do that. I did that. Um, now here we have some. We're printing out the the output of the console, um, but also we're printing our helpful information there to the the, the error stream, and we're printing. Uh, note that we're printing the file name in the error message, that's, that's really helpful. If this function could be called a dozen times with different, uh, in different places, if you just say failed to open file and you didn't say what the file name was, um, that, that could mean that the, the user is stuck. And um, there's, I think, a certain sort of skill in um, figuring out what is too much or too little information, what is the appropriate information. One thing I would say for an error, I'd really don't think that you need to print um, a file name, a source file, or a line number. Um, uh, some people would argue that you know, logging should involve this information. Um, but I would, I would sort of question whether that's going to lead to um, uh, really the best, the best errors. I mean, th if, if there are multiple places in your code where the same error message might be produced, and you want to know which line number, which file that came from, maybe there's a refactor there to be done, perhaps. So, um, um, but yeah. Um, and now we're printing some more information here. This is just to make the point that um, this is this this print print file size. It's very general purpose. Could be used in all sorts of places. But now we're using it somewhere more specifically. We have we have context outside of the function where we now know more. We can say something more helpful. This happens to be a config file. And so just, just printing the fact that it's a config file, yes, we're printing two lines of error message to the, the console, and yes, too much spam in, the, in your log file can be counterproductive, but context is really helpful to the, to the user. And you have to, one of the difficult things is you have to sort of um, pretend that you don't understand this program at all. You have to maybe go on holiday for a year and then come back and use it, or or, or put that program in front of somebody who doesn't even know what you do for a living and see um, where they uh, struggle with it because you will, you will underestimate how difficult your code is to run. And that, again, that is a, that is a skill that takes a, um, it takes a long time and a lot of concentration to sort of uh, get right. So, um, so we're going to evolve this uh, API a little bit now. Um, so we want to return the result because that's far more helpful than actually printing it. Um, so there we go. We're returning um, telg. That's that's what returns the size of the uh, of the file. Um, but now we have the problem. Well, we've used up that one opportunity to return something, because a a C plus plus function it only returns one thing. It can receive any number of uh, input parameters, but it only really returns a, a, um, one object at the end. So we kind of we have some contention there, and this. This is a very fundamental, obvious thing, but this is sort of the root of an awful lot of um, issues with uh, control flow, particularly when, when errors occur. Um, now, we're still printing a helpful error message here. Um, so uh, perhaps optional. Again, I've chosen optional because it's, because it's there. It's, um, it's available in um, uh, revisions of, of C++ going back a few years now, and, it, and it, it's sort of the minimal. Um, tool to do the job here. We're now either s returning the, the the size, or we're not returning anything. So there's there's the optional, and um, I, I, um, still returning the size. But we can also say no. We 
we're returning not a size. Um, and uh, that is, it's really important to distinguish that from the, from the size value itself. Again, still pretty helpful message. Um, now there is um, an alternative. You could, you could abort the program. It's often sort of considered maybe not great practice, but it absolutely depends. Depending on the situation, you might want to fail so fast that uh, um, aborting the program is, is, is the best thing to do. Um, yeah. Actually, I'm, uh, I'm trying to think, did I need that exit? Exit failure there, I'm not sure I did. <laughs> but um, I think it might have done, yes. I did, um, yes, the comment was it might have, the, the compiler might have complained at me. Um, and um, one of the things generally I try to, uh, what a sort of a, a philosophy for life that I have is that I'm not going to understand um, every facet of C++. And I, I don't think there are many people who do. Um, so if ever there is, um, uh, if, if there is some kind of problem, a, a potential bug, uh, an, in, uh, an inefficiency, the first thing I want to try and do is, is, is find out, can I find a tool that will help me? And um, so all of this slide code, I got it to build in a, um, in a, in a test repository, which I um, cloned from my WSS repo, and um, I run uh, static analyzers and um, create unit tests for all of these things. Um, so there's a fair chance, yeah, um, Clang Tidy maybe complained about this. Um, but the, uh, the, I mean, this is a, this is a perfectly uh, acceptable um, way to deal with an error depending on the type of program that you're writing. Fortunately, it doesn't scale very well. This, you know, if you, if, say you write a server and you want, to, um, you want to report back an error, but you want to keep running, then um, uh, uh, you can't really abort the program. But in a lot of situations, if you're worried about f file handles being open or memory being leaked, you don't, you don't have that problem uh, when a board is called a, 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 on, a, on a modern operating system. Those resources will be cleared up for you. So it is something to consider there. Yeah, we're printing um, um, the useful message that we, uh, we received from the, from the main function there. Um, and just, so just generally, um, one last thing about um, uh, returning um, control flow. Um, and uh, yeah, this, um, this is being discussed yesterday, actually. The, um, uh, I tend to find that a program where disappointment can occur is kind of like sort of like a, a race where um, you may have the, you know, the, the 100 meters or, or a 400 meter race and there's a finish line, okay? You may maybe run through a bit of ribbon at the end. Um, or there may be sort of the uh, hurdles or you, you might even, you know, extend the, the, um, the analogy to a, a steeplechase or something like that. There are gonna be zero or more failures, but there tends to be one, one single success um, and that's a pattern I very, very rarely um, see not, not followed. So you might, um, um, doing something might involve several steps. It involves getting, getting a thing that is intermediate. Um, you might fail to, to get that thing. Something could go wrong. Maybe it came from a file and the file wasn't there. Um, so th there's a failure case. And then maybe th from that thing you need to get another thing. Maybe you needed to read in some data and the, the, the file was all wasn't the right format, so now there's a different type of failure. And then eventually there is, there is success. And almost always there is just one, there's one way to succeed. Um, and there's, there's only one end to, to every function. So I find that if, for consistency and readability, um, it, it tends to be the, the pattern that I've, I've found is easiest is to, um, is to place the success at the end and just kind of have could treat the function as a series of hurdles to get over in order to succeed. Um, and this kind of um, brings up conversations about different styles. For instance, uh, um, if, you, if you're if you a structured program um, purist, you might want to put else statements in between uh, after each of those ifs. Um, uh, and and uh, some people would uh, sort of look at those different um, um, failures and the and the and the success and and uh, particularly the scope of the variables, which is maybe not as not as narrow as it could be, and, and say, well, well, let's have nested if statements one inside the other, 
um, but generally, and uh, um, if you think uh, Ms. Misra's C++ 2008 is, uh, um, uh, gives you good advice here, um, I would say not. Return early when you detect, detect failure, and uh, in particular, kind of in terms of cognitive load, you really imagine reading your some, some poor victim of your of your code. The next developer to come along to read your code is looking through this. They um, um, they're going to read this bit, understand it, go okay. Well, if things go well, intermediate th we have intermediate thing. As soon as they move on to the next bit of code, they can forget about the stuff above there. Now the um, um, that's kind of out of sight, out of mind, and they can really concentrate on this bit of code without having to worry about the stuff that, that happened above. If it failed, pro program, the, the, the function ended. Um, so here, we'll just keep going and assume that the, the function um, succeeded. I find this far far easier to, to comprehend. Um, and maintainable code is far easier to, to work on and, and, and keep in a good state. Um, I won't talk too much about exceptions other than they are like a, an incredibly powerful way to deal with um, flow control um, in, in the face of errors. Um, I don't, don't use them um, to react to bugs. I think that is a, that is a mistake. I, um, uh, I will get to bugs later on, but we're still just talking about errors here. And um, uh, yes, they're contentious and um, uh, I have opinions on them, but this, this talk isn't specifically about exceptions, but they are, they can be very efficient and powerful way to solve all of those problems to do with control flow. Okay, so um, that's a, a quick um, uh, um, journey through the end user contract. Uh, next, I'm gonna talk about the standard, which is um, maybe not considered, uh, I guess people probably don't think of the, 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 the program contract that much. Um, maybe also the, the, the standard is actually a, a contract. It's kind of um, uh, diff a different kind of contract depending on how you're reading it. Technically, it's um, it's uh, a, a contract for um, toolchain implementers. Um, but as a developer, um, it's there. The, you're not kind of really expected to read it. I wouldn't recommend reading it. But um, embodied within it, um, you, you can consider there's a contract between the user of a toolchain and the provider of the tool chain, the, the, the implementer. They, if they have, if they have um, written a conforming implementation, then you have um, uh, certain expectations um, and certain guarantees uh, as a developer. So let's take a look at that, that contract. Again, um, you'll spot some uh, familiar looking um, sort of wording here. The exchange of promises between a C++ developer and C++ implementers. Excuse me. The um, uh, now the the, the authors um, again. I mentioned authors briefly. Um, you could find that that the author, the client, and the provider of the contract uh, are one and the same person. That that can be the case. Um, but bear in mind, the provider of the contract isn't necessarily the author. That's a different person. Traditionally, in the olden days, it used um, 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 it used to be the case that there would be somebody maybe a systems analyst or somebody with a, a, a title like that who would, um, who would spec out uh, a program or an API um, uh, possibly months before anybody actually got to implementing it. That's um, uh, gladly not the case anymore, but we're talking about um, providers and, and, uh, and users of con uh, clients of, of contracts in this talk. So, and importantly, um, when I talk about um, a violation here, I'm really focusing on runtime disappointment. And, and so really, I think pretty much entirely, um, if, you, if you, as, as a user of the C++ standard, I, uh, a developer, if you, if you, break, the, if you break the contracts implicit in that, in that document, in that contract, um, that's a bug and it's going to lead to undefined behavior. And uh, the, the, the dreaded UB, um, term is uh, how far into the talk have we before I, have we got before I mentioned it so um uh, but yeah all all you be really means all it should mean to a developer is that there is uh, we're talking about bugs here things that need to be fixed in code and um, while traditionally there's sort of uh, I think uh, 
um, there's been difficulty about writing um, correct programs because, because of part of the nature of undefined behavior um, generally, and it's a bit contentious, but uh, I think it's very important to treat um, bugs, in, um, and especially undefined behavior, um, as just something that you, you, you have to fix before you proceed at all. Like you wouldn't, if you could get a compiler that um, took code that had compile time errors and you somehow managed to program it so it continued past those and built the program anyway, would you be happy with that? Um, I mean, that's, that's all that C++ is about very often is, is having this static um, safety um, that, a, that a compiled language with, with, um, with strong typing and et cetera brings you. Um, I think it's really important to treat bugs uh, in exactly the same way, have the same kind of sort of zero to tolerance, uh, zero tolerance attitude towards them. Um, a lot of things get simpler if you, if you kind of have that mentality. So we'll be talking about bugs. Um, and uh, so if you have a program with bugs in, then your program is incorrect. Um, and a, and a, an incorrect program, a program with bugs in, has undefined behavior. Um, and potentially is vulnerable. There's, there's, uh, there's naughty people who might be trying to um, use the, 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 trying to abuse the program in order to compromise the system. Um, uh, um, you may have provided an opportunity for them to, to cause problems. Um, and also, by extension, you now have sort of failed your user. You, you violated the, as a provider of the end user contract, you've let the user down, unfortunately. So, um, so it's sort of doubly important that, uh, that bugs are dealt with. Um, and so now, yes, we're, we were talking about errors up until now. Um, we're talking about bugs. And uh, um, because they're kind of, there's a sort of a, a notion, at least I have, of purity in, in programs. You can, you can sort of theorize a correct program with, with no bugs in, um, um, whereas you can't really sort of uh, um, write a program that opens a file and know that the file will always be there. I mean, you, you kind of can. You can sort of um, reform these contracts, but, but typically you don't do that. So um, yes, um, given this purity, um, we ought to be aiming for uh, you know, no, zero tolerance to bugs and, uh, and trying to eliminate them entirely. Uh, obviously, that, that is somewhat an ideal. Um, and I think the sort of the, the attitude that uh, um, a lot of uh, online infrastructure developers have of uh, trying to um, um, maximize reliability and uptime and, and try and get a system that has, let's say, 99.99999% uptime um, and just sort of um, chase nine, so to speak, I think is the is the right way to uh, approach this if you're being sort of very pragmatic about it. Um, what kind of bugs are there? I tend to be two that um, uh, tend to sort of stand out, cause problems, um, uh, uh, that are prominent. And that they are sort of arithmetic bugs and bugs to do with object lifetime, sort of memory, um, uh, out, out, you know, out of bound errors, that kind of thing. Uh, leaks, um, technically not uh, undefined behavior. Arguably, I mean, you can write a program that, that leaks memory, and that's okay if, if, that, if that's what you intended to do. However, it's, um, it's a code smell. So you imagine that, that you have a program, uh, and if it fails, it needs to fail super fast. Um, it could be absolutely critical. I'll be talking about a bit of software later where this, ha this happens. Um, and let's say that, that, that um, program just happens to have a quite complex data structure with arrays of, of um, tuples, of, of variants, of arrays, of vectors, um, and that stuff all has to be deallocated just so that you can exit the program. Do you really need to deallocate all that memory that's about to get deallocated, freed up anyway? Um, you might not, uh, in which case it might be fine to leak your code. You might have a program, um, it loads up a text file, it converts it to a JSON file, it saves out the JSON file. Do you need to now save, do you need to deallocate that, um, that original text buffer? Not really. And um, sometimes, particularly if you've been using the heap a lot, it could be quite fragmented. It could take a long time to do this. Um, so typically, yes, um, 
uh, if you want a quiet life, an easy life, um, uh, on a typical day, yes, you try and avoid leaks, um, absolutely. And uh, if a leak occurs in your code, it's almost certainly a sign that, um, at the very least, you're, you've not really thought the program through, uh, more likely that there is some bug somewhere. So, um, however, um, just like with, with stood abort being, in some cases, a, a legitimate way to, um, to um, deal with the control flow in response to errors, similarly, there are cases where you might uh, be totally okay with uh, memory leaks. Typically not, but uh, it, it, yeah, it does get pointed out. These, a memory leak is not undefined behavior per, per se. It's just it's an object there that has no references to it, that's all. Right, so an arithmetic problem. Okay, and uh, yes, there's another coffee voucher here for the first person who can identify the bug in this program. <laughs> and my goodness, it's, um, you really need it if you can't uh, <laughs> spot it. Anyone? Divide by zero, who is that? And um, yeah, uh, th it was was not a trick question, um, and it's one of the simplest one of the simplest programs that uh, that that can have a bug in it. Really, um, there it is, line three. Um, so that's the, the that's the problem I've identified there, the solution tools, um, and uh, I'll say it again, tools. I'll say it a third time, tools. Um, tools are how we, we get to you know, a situation where we've got this, this programming language that can, um, that can let you write bugs that are really obvious, um, but, but which, which uh, the, the standard does not oblige the implementers to point out to you. Um, just because the standard doesn't oblige them to doesn't mean that they won't go ahead and try and make your life easier. And they go to a huge amount of effort to do that, uh, just because the standard doesn't compel them to, um, doesn't mean they're not <laughs> morally obliged to, and uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, wanting to create a, a tool that people actually want to use, um, they do a huge amount. So this, um, these are some GCC or Clang specific um, compiler flags that, that I'm pointing out now. Uh, the, first, the first set, W error, W all, W extra, Pedantic. These are all flags that will um, allow a compiler without without too much fuss to identify problems in your program. Ones which maybe your, maybe your program is technically still a legal, uh, well formed um, C++ program. However, it is uh, um, it at least has some kind of um, dubious nature to it. Uh, there's something in there that you probably want to deal with. Um, I turn these flags on uh, routinely, and um, and then I keep them on all the time, and uh, uh, and I would I'd recommend uh, other people do so. I mean, pedantic potentially you might want to um, sort of deviate slightly from the strict interpretation of the C++ standard because um, GNU um, does does deviate from that slightly. There's some interesting things to do with 128-bit integers and and things like that, that for which you might want to to have a, not a 100% conformant um, program, but certainly W all, W extra um, will find loads of stuff that you really probably need to know about. And then W error seals the deal. If those errors are discovered, then they're treated as if they were a compiler error. The program, uh, is, uh, the, the compiler refuses to build the program. Um, we have that zero tolerance to, uh, um, to um, potential problems that uh, I think is so important. Um, but maybe less less well known, um, but really really useful. We can still be finding problems at execution time, and um, this is maybe with our with our um, uh, emphasis on sort of uh, you know static compile time, ca catching things early on in the developmental development cycle. Um, we sort of. Um, I'm not so keen on um, er errors that are not apparent until execution time. However, um, I think any any modern um, uh, software project, uh, you should be writing tests. You should be testing your code before, long before you release it. Uh, 
that that used to be somewhat contentious or open to interpretation. I really don't think it is these days. Um, and so, if you're going to, while you're testing your code, you you can um, you can instrument that code to tell you to to further issue errors and warnings um, and and stop you and, and force you to address bugs. And uh, so, th this is one example of a, a flag that you can set. Um, uh, Clang GCC will allow you to to set this. Uh, I know um, uh, Microsoft's compiler has. There's um, many great features like this as well. I'll, I'll go through some more of them later on, but uh, um, th there's some basic ones. And all of these will help you with, um, the, with the bug we just saw. In fact, um, that's not entirely true. The, um, the, the, uh, the, at least uh, GCC here is able to um, just straight away spot that the, you know, this is a program that, <laughs> where things are not gonna go wrong. And while technically it, it's not a compiler error, um, straight away, the, without even turning on any war, extra warning flags, the um, GCC is saying, I don't think you want to do that. Um, and then if you now go, go through and uh, um, turn on W error there, the, the program won't compile. The only reason I didn't add that here was just so that I could demonstrate the sanitizer working, because uh, in order to show the sanitizer, I have to at least compile the program. And um, sure enough, so the, this program will, it will halt anyway, um, at a divide by zero um, um, bug because because of the the nature of the 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 system that it's running on. However, in theory, like a, maybe on an embedded system or an older system, um, this might just carry on with undefined behavior in the program. Um, but once the sanitizer is turned on, you you not only get a guarantee that the program is going to halt, uh, it's going to exit with a non-zero status, um, and it's going to um, crucially print a, a helpful error message for you. And uh, if you have a, um, a debugger attached, um, quite likely your ID will take you to, um, to the point in the code where the bug happened. This is all super helpful stuff for a developer. So this second example I um, uh, got from a, a talk earlier in the year. Um, uh, and um, this kind of stumped me slightly to begin with because I wasn't sure where to begin with um, quite what's wrong with this um, uh, with this with this program, I actually I think uh, maybe suggested that it wasn't undefined behavior the last the first time I gave this talk. But uh, well, let's go through what's going on here. Um, we're creating a vector uh, of ints. We're initializing it um, with some values, and uh, I'm kind of following the rule here that the the integer is also the same as the index. Um, each element um, it kind of indexes to itself, so to speak. Um, so we have two two elements in this vector. The, the, the first element in, in index zero has a value zero, and then another one has value one. And then we push back, crucially, we, we um, push this third element on, in, onto the back of the, the vector separately. And uh, one of the properties of a vector is that it, um, uh, it has sort of an exponential growth, um, which is an incredibly useful uh, uh, property um, in terms of uh, um, keeping a uh, number of um, uh, resizing operations. Uh, down, but so basically, what will happen when we push back um, a third element? Uh, vector will not only have to sort of resize um, to accommodate a third element; it'll probably add a little extra capacity on as well, it, it, on the assumption that well, if the if the if callback was if pushback was called once, it's probably going to be called again. We don't want to have to reallocate and and uh, and recopy all of those values. So let's maybe have. Um, have room for four elements, even though there are three here. Um, so then we sort of, uh, you could easily imagine this sort of off by one error that uh, I, I may be even still um, um, cause from time to time where I go, okay, well, there's three elements in the in this vector. I will I will access element number three, but of course we count at zero. So this is, this is um, an element that is not allocated yet. There probably is space for it. And this kind of makes it um, hard for the for the sanitizer to identify that that there's a bug here because um, th that the access is into some allocated memory. So it's not like it's uh, it's not a really obvious heap error, which is what um, the address sanitizer would probably do a pretty good job of, of catching. However, it certainly is a bug because we're, we're referring to an element that doesn't exist. Um, also, even though that integer is there, it, it has an indeterminate value. It's not 
um, its, its lifetime has not, not begun yet. Um, so in theory, I mean, maybe memory sanitizer could, could find this, but that, that's a um, slightly trickier um, tool to use, I found. Um, one really easy solution to this, though, is, uh, so, I mean, this is an example of really um, uh, a library, a bug when using the, the standard library. Now, example one, it was a bug using the, the language. This is a bug using the library, and, um, and those uh, library implementers, uh, just like the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the compiler um, implementers, uh, really want to help you find um, the bugs that you write. And so you just need to define one of these uh, macros, depending on which standard library implementation you're using, and then you, again, you'll get a, a runtime error with a, with a message, the program will stop, you now, uh, it's brought to your attention that you've got a bug um, and that you need to fix it. Um, I should point out solution here and problem, um, you know, just, just because the program crashed, it doesn't mean that, the, 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 that we, ha we have a solution to the, um, the bug. The, the problem really is about knowing that you have a problem. The problem is being informed that, you've, you know, that there's a bug there. I think um, when, when people, um, form their opinion of undefined behavior, often, certainly in, 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 um, in my case, I probably um, had, had written some code with a bug in it. Um, the program didn't work properly. I probably felt a bit humiliated um, and annoyed that, that I had this really powerful um, tool and a, an awesome computer and uh, um, a really obvious bug in front of me, and I hadn't been told. Um, the tools had not helped me. Um, figure out what was going wrong, and then somebody said, well, you know, that's undefined behavior. There's this 700-page document that, that uh, and, and down here on page 622, there's uh, an explanation of what you did wrong. Um, I don't think that's, that's good enough for a, a typical um, C++ developer. It's certainly um, uh, wh where I work, I, I, I'm, I don't expect anybody to, to, um, to have bad news delivered like that, and I think that's why it's crucial that uh, um, developers are all made aware of um, tools and that they're enabled um, for the projects they work in. And so whilst testing, they, they can find these problems. So that's the, that's the solution I'm talking about. It's, it's awareness. It's um, uh, enabling the tools to help you find these problems. From there, the, 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 the problem of fixing the bug is relatively trivial. Small flags. Um, uh, and uh, I don't know if this is readable, even up close. Yeah, yeah. Oh, perfectly readable. If you all want to come to the front and take a look. Um, so, in in the links that I shared uh, on, on the Discord uh, channel, um, I hopefully um, provided a link to um, a repo called Papers. And in here, I basically before this was a talk, it was an essay that I wrote. You know, the, the people asking me, what, what, you know, how do you deal with these different types of disappointment? The first thing I did was write, write a very long, dry um, essay on GitHub um, that very few people read. And uh, um, at least it made it easy to write, the, write these slides. Um, there are many, many amazing tools and flags and things. They do all sorts of things. They don't just trap runtime errors. I mean, we've, we've talked about some of the uh, st basically static analysis, the... Uh, um, the identification of, of bugs or potential bugs at compile time, which is always always preferable. Um, um, but there are all sorts of other things. You know, there's different types of um, uh, flags for trapping runtime errors and, and for doing things as well to deal with it. You might um, rather like turning warnings into errors. You can actually um, get your sanitizer to identify UB, um, diagnose it, and then carry on running. I really don't know why you'd want to do that, but... Um, um, there are situations, I'll, I'll go into in a bit more detail later, where you might want to do that. And then additionally, there are things that you can insert into the code to, um, to communicate to your tools um, the location of bugs. And this is where things get uh, a little more contentious and, uh, and where some of the um, unresolved uh, discussions in, in, um, in the standards committee uh, kind of uh, arise from. And then course, then we have the optimization flags here, or, or, or um, flags that, that tell, the, tell the compiler, 
what you how you want to sort of deal with the fact that uh, UB is a is a thing in the standard. Now, um, some of these are op optimization flags, and uh, there's some there's a a lot of um, um, confusion about how undefined behavior interacts with optimization in compilers, and uh, it is really quite a complicated thing to wrap one's brain around the idea that. Uh, because there potentially are bugs in code that um, that a compiler can make code faster. It is um, it really is quite quite mind bending. Um, I would recommend a uh, a talk by Chandler Kruth um, that he gave at CppCon in 2016, which uh, explains uh, will give some really great examples of how the presence of UB in the standard can lead to um, faster um, code. Uh, and I think um, people maybe um, have difficulty distinguishing between the idea that there's UB in a standard from the idea that there's UB in a program. Um, it's arguably a useful thing for there to be um, UB in a standard. Um, it's, uh, as I hope I've made clear, a pretty terrible thing for there to be UB in, in your code for all sorts of reasons before you even get on to uh, um, enabling the, the optimizer in your code. Um, but yeah, this talk is more about sort of safety and correctness. Um, I, th I feel like the, the, uh, the story about um, performance and undefined behavior has already sort of been told. And now I sort of need to um, uh, reinforce the idea that just because you, um, UB is, a, is a, a construct that can help make code more efficient, doesn't mean that you, there's a trade-off here that it's necessarily less safe as a result. Um, in particular, with, with things like sanitizers, we're seeing that having um, the notion of a bug um, sort of formally in, in the language sort of enables tools to, um, to bring them to your attention. I think that's kind of a, a positive thing, and it can lead to, it should lead to safer programs. Right, so C++ API contract violations. That is the kind of um, uh, um, contracts that we think about when um, discussing the, the contract's language feature in, in the standard. Um, and so this has been sort of, sort of fairly familiar territory now. We've gone sort of through s some things you maybe not even considered as contracts. Um, but now we move on to the, um, the actual um, the contracts you're maybe thinking of. Uh, again, um, similar wording, um, promise between developers, uh, using and implementing a C++ API, and again, often um, they may be one and the same person. Um, and again, a, a violation of a C++ um, API contract is a bug, and a, a, a bug here is still undefined behavior. Again, that's uh, something that people are maybe um, not always entirely on board with, but I think it's sort of fundamentally uh, um, an un unavoidable truth. Um, so I'll give a few uh, um, uh, examples here. So um, as somebody who works in automotive, I, I, I'm not a huge expert on PID controllers, but certainly I work with people who know all about them. Um, a PID controller, it's uh, basically um, a, uh, a, a controller that, that tries to regulate a, um, a variable we call here a process variable. So let's imagine that you're um, you're, you're boiling a kettle or or, or um, en enabled an auto cruise on a on a vehicle, and uh, you have a certain um, you know temperature or or speed or something represented here by the process variable. And um, we want we want that variable to to be at or roughly at a certain value. Here um, it starts off at 30, but we want it to be 10. So um, we're trying to regulate that value so that it goes to 10, but it's uh, the process variable is something you can't directly change. You can't just say the temperature of, of the water in your kettle is 98 degrees. You have to affect that value through an input, through a correction. So here we have the correction. Um, uh, basically, when, when the value is too high here, we have a negative correction. We kind of, uh, in the hopes that that will bring this value down. Um, and this can be quite tricky if there is a delay in between applying the correction and the value changing uh, in, a, in a real dynamic system. That's a tricky problem to solve, and that's what a, a PID controller 
basically does. Um, apologies for the, the layperson's description there. Um, and a P PID, it's sort of a well-established, basically it's a formula with some inputs that sort of tweak um, the, the, uh, the, the rate, shall we say, at which the, um, uh, the ideal value is, is tended towards. Um, and so here's another section from the, the Wikipedia page um, on PID controllers. Um, there's, if once, you, once you're sort of in, in the headspace of, of contracts, you could probably look at this and see contracts everywhere. But there's in particular a, a fairly, I hope a fairly obvious um, contractual detail in here that if you read it fairly carefully and not all the way through even, you could probably spot uh, a contract somewhat implicit in this description. I'm wondering if anybody can guess the contract that um, uh, I'm thinking of by just studying this. Yes, Daniela. Non-negative, very good, yes. And you haven't seen these slides ahead of time, have you? No. Ed. You love, love coffee, though. <laughs> okay. Great, so yes, if you, if you set, set one of these values negative, here I've set the, um, the, the, the P, um, uh, um, uh, factor as negative, um, we get an undesirable result if you uh, um, if your auto cruise or or kettle does this, it's not going to end well. Um, so um, and and this is like just a nice example of something where there's no UB here, uh, at least until this value gets to maybe an overflow or an infinite uh, value perhaps. But um, but it's certainly bad and wrong, and we don't want it to happen. Um, and uh, so I, I, um, I hunted out a, uh, an implementation of this because I was far too much of a coward to uh, just derive it from the, the formula there, just in case I got something embarrassingly wrong. And I found a, a great implementation that um, pr provided um, uh, C++ PID controller, but um, felt the need to cr uh, implement it using a class with a pimple, using the pimple idiom which to me seemed rather like overkill. Um, so I sort of cut some of that out and uh, um, wrote it in, in sort of the style that I sort of um, tended towards over the years, which tends to be, you know, I like to write classes when, when they're appropriate, but I tend um, not to go to them automatically. So here we have um, PID controller, has, they're called three terms, um, but really there are sort of three components that are used in various places, including for terms. Um, the proportional, integral, and derivative uh, terms. And they sort of uh, try and regulate this value in, in, in different ways. Um, um, so I have a struct, a struct for that. Um, and then there are um, parameters, sort of uh, um, what are called parameters in, in the model. Uh, you know, that there are far more parameters if you, look, if you mean C++ uh, API parameters. But here, really, there are... The, the k constants, uh, the, the three constants of, 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 um, of those component values there, and then a, a delta time, which you, you, you don't really want to vary um, over time if you want to keep things simple at least. Um, and so they're sort of the, the tweakables, if you like. If you were a game developer, you might sort of, there might be sliders for these to, to get the results that you want. Um, and there, yeah, we have an instance of the component, the, the, the k values, kind of the constants. Um, and then there's sort of some state where um, um, we're sort of um, measuring difference over time, and so we need to uh, to um, to sort of measure some dif differences, as it were, um, and these need to be retained. And in the implementation I found um, online, these these seem to be the part of the justification for writing a class that well we have some state, therefore um, let's store that as member variables. And uh, um, I'm I'm not uh, possibly for uh, optimize, optimization reasons. I, I'm not convinced that that would kind of really be the case nowadays, though. Um, and then there's sort of inputs to each iteration of this of this controller. Um, there's the set point, um, the value we want to get to, 10 in our example, and the process variable, which is the thing that we're trying to control that's out there in the real world. And then the result is, well, the correction, how much we think we want to sort of um, input into the system. This could be, you know, throttle in the case of uh, um, uh, um, auto cruise or um, maybe uh, a current pass through a filament in a kettle, I don't know. Um, and, you know, we get back 
the current state as well. So, so here we sort of input, um, going back up, yeah, we, we input um, the, the, the set point in the process variable, but also the previous, the, the, the state values that are passed in the previous time, and then the parameters that don't change, don't change at all. Um, and yeah, so, so here we just have one, one free function that, that takes those three different groups of variables and returns back a result. And uh, um, maybe somewhat the, the style that I prefer, but this is, you know, if I was gonna write a general purpose PID controller, this is kind of where I might start. Um, so let's take a look at the, the implementation. And the, the whole point for, for showing this is because here in, um, this is kind of, I guess, C++ 20, although I'm not going out of my way to use um, lots of shiny new features. Um, but uh, while there isn't a, a, um, a language feature for contracts, um, what we, when we talk about an API um, contract um, enforcement or check, we're really just talking about asserts, which seems awfully 1970s. I'm sure uh, the assert.h macro has been around for a very, very long time. And um, what, what these uh, three lines here are doing are really nothing much different. They're basically sort of um, stating something in code um, which is potentially useful to, to a machine and certainly it's crucial to point out uh, useful to a human who's trying to understand what the rules of, uh, rules of using this API are. Um, but there they are, sort of the, the, the non-negatives. Um, also, probably don't want, um, you probably want positive time, I'm guessing. Uh, um, and then, so basically, you sort of reproducing the equation from that uh, Wikipedia page. We sort of um, uh, we derive the three terms here um, uh, with the, with those uh, with those sort of tweakable values, um, and that that is the one, one of the one features that uh, I'd like to point out, um, which is I think C plus plus twenty um, that comes from. Uh, uh, with props to C for, for implementing this first, and also um, if, you, if you're a fan of Python like me, it's quite normal to be able to name parameters going into functions and things like that. Uh, I really like the way that it makes it very hard to get these three doubles confused, which is, uh, you know, a, um, uh, one, one potential way to, to produce bugs. Um, you can do that this way without having to, you know, without having to um, compromise the constants of this, of this variable. It's, Everything in this in this function is uh, is constant. Um, and the, yeah, just add those terms up. Um, return it with with the the new the new state for the next for the next iteration. Um, but really, we we're really here for these asserts. Um, and uh, yeah, so kind of probably uh, at this point, I'd be quite disappointed by just how vanilla these things look. They're, uh, um, but they are very powerful. Um, another quick example, uh, really quite different. This isn't a this isn't an API. Some well, this isn't a function, um, but a type that's 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 pretty weak in, in many ways. Um, we have, uh, and this is this is from um, it, it's it comes from a, a, a real bug that uh, that 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 cost um, a former colleague of mine a weekend having to to look at, which uh, sounds kind of um, not cool, but. Uh, this is in sort of business critical software that would be losing a fantastic amount of money every minute if uh, uh, if it went down. It didn't actually. It just um, um, the server just started to uh, uh, occasionally bomb out, just sort of fail with an out, it turned out an out of memory um, error from time to time, and uh, it, it made it through testing and into production, and just was a, a, enough of a concern that it needed immediate attention. So. Um, large um, databases of, of elements that needed to be looked up um, right, were given a unique identifier from a 32-bit you know, unsigned UID, something we're probably all very familiar with. Um, and where one particular value of this uh, uh, identifier is kind of marked out as a special value, um, kind of like a sentinel to, to mean not a thing. And um, again, pretty common pattern there. And uh, yes, minus one just kind of sort of means all bits set. It's, uh, it's kind of equivalent to, uh, to being the maximum number. If you, if you think it makes sense that minus one is the same as 4.3 billion, then um, that's, <laughs> I think uh, a, a lot of um, software engineers kind of do. Um, 
we're just so used to uh, kind of thinking in this crazy upside down um, uh, world where minus one does equal 4.3 billion. But uh, but uh, I would I would argue we have to stop thinking like that. But uh, anyway, so um, one of the features of the server, um, a bit set, basically the, the, for each of these elements, we there could be a flag on or off for each and every one of them. And there could be maybe 30,000 elements or, or more on each server. Um, and um, so we, uh, when we want to get that bit set, uh, that see whether the, the bit is set. It could be, uh, um, you know, is is purple or uh, is present on this server or something like that. There could be all sorts of flags, each one with a, their own a, a bit set um, uh, object. So here in the in the getter, um, and we're probably sort of um, playing a bit hard and fast with const correctness here, but um, we had some helpful code to to say, well, if this index is outside the range of bits that we have stored, we are going to be really helpful and reallocate the array and um, uh, resize it with that bit set to false, OK? Um, and I haven't given any hints at what the bug might be so far. But uh, I think maybe some people might have, might have guessed it. Some people who like coffee who could maybe um, suggest what happened here. Bearing in mind this is a... Uh, I will t optimistically head towards you. Could you suggest what maybe this this bug was? Probably the exploit getter that you were hoping. Yes, it was. Yeah, Great guess. Yes, indeed. Um, yes, and uh, in the modern era, with um, uh, so the the um, the the, uh, the guess was that a value, um, an index with, with the invalid value had been passed in. Um, so basically, somebody somewhere had not checked that the that the, the, the UID was the invalid state and just passed it in. And this thing on quite a large server very happily sort of allocated the megabytes necessary to have, you know, four, four billion bits. It's not actually that many, but on a, on a server where, with, the, with many processors, where it's a 64-bit machine. Mm -hmm. so the one that the yes, yeah. Yes, I mean, like um, uh, one of the largest instances of a cloud machine that you that you can easily sort of uh, um, acquire um, yeah um, it was allocating this, this fairly large array uh, and then returning back you know that value is false um, but if it did this for enough pro enough individual processes for each CPU were were running to to serve requests and eventually this the minus one would occur in each of them and they were all allocating this large amount of memory and suddenly this, this the server was struggling. Um, and well, I mean, where do you begin with uh, how to try and mitigate, how to avoid this, how to change coding styles to, to avoid this? Just bear in mind, this is a code base dating back well before C++ 11, despite the const extra there. Um, the, I mean, it's difficult to know where to start, but there's certainly some observations that won't be too controversial, or well, some of them, uh, such as if you have sentinel values, uh, I think null, null putter is probably the most famous of them. Um, they, they tend to be problematic, um, and often they're there sort of as a micro-optimization, um, probably surprisingly ineffective as well. Um, and then that, that, that code, that, that branch, that was helpful code, and I use, I use scare quotes when I say helpful. I really um, am not a fan of, of, of code that's more complex in order to try and be helpful and to try and deal with um, perhaps particularly bugs at runtime. If you're trying to deal with a bug at runtime, you're just, you don't have that zero tolerance attitude to, to them. And you're just gonna, you typically make things worse. You need to know about it and fix it. Um, yeah, uh, I could talk about unsigned and signed uh, integers as well, but that's, that's a whole nother talk. Um, so very quickly, the test user contract. So I've probably alluded to it a lot. Um, uh, there's the, the tool developers, they provide uh, tools to help you as somebody who's testing your code, as the developer or or, um, or a, like a full-time tester, you can enable some some tools um, and uh, and use them to find bugs. Uh, and, and assert is an example. Sanitizers are another example. Um, this is not really something that the committee uh, has a particularly has a say in, rather except other than by saying. Um, uh, implementers are allowed to do things like uh, um, trap 
undefined behavior because um, the standard doesn't um, say one way or another what the behavior is uh, when a bug occurs. And that's, that's where UB is really val valuable because it allows a lot of leeway here. Um, uh, but the really crucial thing is what this does is when you, you um, what is, um, what is uh, a, a bug from the point of view of the user, really, dis really disappointing thing, is now an error from the point of view of the developer. The same bug changes state from being um, a bug to an error. And now, instead of us wanting to uh, have this zero tolerance to, to these bugs, we want, we want all those things that we, we give to our own users, uh, helpful output. We want, we want the program to stop, change its control flow to make it as obvious as possible, um, to, make it, to make the user aware of what's going on. It's kind of confusing because we're taking a bunch of hats and swapping them around, and I think it confuses uh, a lot of people when trying to think about the, the various uh, contracts that we have to deal with when coming up with a contract feature. Um, but it is, it's, it is a type of contract. Um, and it's, uh, it's an incredibly powerful and useful one, and it's one worth being aware of. Um, and here's, here's an example of it. Turn on sanitizer, and uh, we, we, we get that bug, as I, as I mentioned before. That is um, the, the implementer satisfying the, the test user contract for the benefit of the developer. Um, and so when I write a, a, an assert, um, to keep things as simple as possible, so maybe, um, uh, in a in a debug build, I will I, I might explicitly trap um, and you know terminate the program as soon as a, an error occurs. Maybe I could call std abort there. But the important thing is we don't just continue as if nothing went wrong because a, a bug is, is you know is not something that you can you can deal with at runtime. However, uh, if if I'm confident that uh, I've I've uh, identified enough bugs, I've got enough nines there, my correctness and reliability. Uh, if I want to optimize now uh, in um, confident that that's the case. But crucially, also, if I'm testing my code and I want to turn on the undefined behavior sanitizer, I'll use this version of, of my assert, and this upsets an awful lot of people, this, this particular choice. I will basically say, um, I will introduce um, custom UB into the program. I will say, when, when this assert fails, that's undefined behavior because that's what it is. Um, a bug is a bug. Um, so here we have, th this is the, this is the, GNU, the GCC or Clang version of, of introducing UB. This is the, uh, the Microsoft equivalent. Uh, there'll be a, a, um, a, a function, um, I think it's already been um, voted into C and is coming to C++ as well, called std unreachable, or at least in, in the C++ standard library. So this is something that is being standardized, so it's certainly, has uses. Um, uh, so yeah, um, I think this is a this is a, a this is a good workflow. It's it simplifies things um, because UB is a, it's just such a strong indicator that there is a bug. It's you very rarely get uh, um, false positives. In fact, you don't get false positives with UB. It is it is uh, unambiguously a bug. Um, yeah. So this is just me ranting. I won't. I will spare you the the, the full rant. Hopefully you've you've got the idea by now. Um, but I think some of the some people sort of say, well, there's this there's two types of bugs. There's the, the standard um, UB, maybe even specifically language, but not standard library UB. Um, and then that's and those those are different to the UB that, that to the contract violations people introduce into their their own code. And I would say. That that is that's dangerous thinking. You imagine you have a very simple API here. You take um, you pass in value one, you get back capital A. Okay, and um, you might think, well, um, there's maybe there's no UB in this. This is this is like the, the developer wrote this, not 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 the implementer, the the the, the, the you know the toolchain implementer. Um, but actually, there are there are values for for which um, there is there is overflow. Um, so that's actual. The bad UB, as people call it, is introduced by by having by violating the the, the contract of a of a user space API. And you might think, okay, well, but at least we know about that. We know now what the what the uh, limits are to this API. Not necessarily. Um, one of the benefits of UB is that it reserves the implementer's right 
do you change the implementation? This might be a more efficient solution on certain systems. Um, and now it is, it is far easier to, uh, far easier to um, cause UB now. It's a totally different type of language UB, as we call it. Um, but I think having a distinction between these different um, types of UB based on which contract is being violated, uh, I think it's, it's destined to failure always. And uh, um, uh, bugs should just be treated as bugs no matter um, which contract they're violating when, when the bug occurs. I think that's the only way that we can proceed um, with a, a holistic approach to, to contracts. Um, now, there are different ways um, that you might deal with bugs, and, and that's important too. Different users of C++ uh, have very different needs. In particular, log and continue, there's a lot of um, buggy legacy code out there, sort of business logic that hasn't been tested because it was written in a, a, a more innocent <laughs> time, perhaps. And, um, and uh, you know, I think turning on optimization for, for some of the software is maybe a bit premature, particularly as optimizers get more aggressive at uh, uh, exploiting UB. And then uh, I think that languages like C++, by having UB, maybe have some advantages provided that code is tested. I think we, we have a very bad um, reputation for, um, uh, for, ha for introducing uh, poorly tested code into you know, really critical systems, um, and as a result, introducing exploitations, which then uh, terrible things result. Uh, however, once code is tested using these modern tools, um, you can get to, to a point where you can have um, the fastest and really, really safe code. And you've, it's, it's correct as well because um, the, the tools are now helping you uh, identify where, where bugs are, um, where with safer languages uh, these things wouldn't be considered bugs, so the tools couldn't, couldn't find them. I mean, the, um, uh, integer overflow is, is a great example, but there are maybe others. I wouldn't say C++ is the perfect language here, but I think a non-safe language is out there, maybe yet to be invented, that um, is safer than safe languages, ironically. And uh, um, I really would like to work towards um, pushing C++ in that direction. Um, yeah, uh, if, I have, if I have a minute or two left, um, a great example of um, somebody sort of taking Taking this approach to zero tolerance of bugs, obviously you you send a, a, a Mars probe all the way to Mars and then try and drop it onto a, into an atmosphere with what a, 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 a quarter of the the um, um, density of of Earth. I can't I can't remember the details, but this is just a terrifying piece of engineering to try and pull off. The um, the software engineers insisted that there were two percent um, two percent of the code was assertions. Two percent of all of the code. In the and the lander module that dropped dropped the rover to the the planet was assertions, and they remained enabled after testing. Basically, if any of those asserts fired whilst this thing was dropping from the sky, um, the process would have to be rebooted. Um, you know, the the idea of having the program in a bad state with a known bug in it um, was uh, utterly intolerable. It'd be better to just kill the program flat and and restart it really quickly and hope that it recovered and landed. I guess that didn't happen, but that was the approach that they that they chose to take there, and uh, that seems quite um, extreme. But I guess it was successful. Um, so there are many ways to 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 go about, um, you know, dealing with safety. That one rather an extreme one, certainly. Um, I'll I'll sort of leave, leave it there with just the just the message. Please sanitize your code. Test your code. Sanitize it. Um, uh, turn, turn on instrumentation, make sure you run code coverage tools to, to or, or be certain that you're testing all of your code with the sanitizers enabled, um, fuzz testing also, awesome tool for, for seeking out these bugs and then, uh, and then fixing them uh, to get your nines up. Once you've done that, then, you could, then it's safe to optimize your code. Probably not before though. Um, and uh, yes, you will uh, have uh, many years of safe coding ahead of you. And uh, please check out my, um, uh, my project, WSS. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I recommend 
using it as the template for sort of future projects. Um, I have, you know, fuzzers and sanitizers and unit and functional tests. It runs with um, continuous integration from GitHub and GitLab. It's integrated with Conan and um, VC package. Um, it's just the, 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 the project that I would sort of recommend if, um, because a lot of these tools are fiddly to get, to get um, integrated into your continuous integration pipeline. I've done most of the work here for you so that you don't have to, to do that. And, uh, uh, and, and please feel free to request other tools that I haven't included here that you'd like to see. Um, and that's it. Um, uh, I think we've run over a little bit, but uh, uh, if there are any questions, um, uh, I could probably maybe take a few questions now, and then I'll be around for another half hour to answer some more. And I still have uh, coffee coupons. <laughs>